All right. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to episode 16 of Blue Leadership with your host, Dennis Nair. Dennis is a 26-year law enforcement veteran and retired chief from the state of New York. He's also a proud graduate of the 240th session of the FBI National Academy and the 61st session of the FBI LIDA Command Institute. The Blue Leadership video broadcast is brought to you by the nationally ranked Master of Science in Law Enforcement and Public Safety Leadership Program at the University of San Diego. You can learn more about the LEPSL program at criminaljustice.sandiego.edu. And with that, I'll kick things over to your host, Dennis, to introduce our featured guest. Thanks. Sarah, thank you. And um, great to be back here. We took a short break just because um, there was only so many hours in the last few weeks and, um, and things have been pretty hectic, but we're glad to be back. And today we have Chief Dave Norris of the Menlo Park Police Department in California. Um, Quick introduction um, is that Chief Norris spent the first 27 years of his career working with the San Mateo PD. Um, he came up through the ranks there and did a lot of great things for that PD and hence hired, was hired as a chief for um, the Menlo Park PD where he's been now for the last two years. Um, he's a um, graduate of a post command college and also a graduate of the Master of Science in Law Enforcement and Public Safety Leadership Lepsel, as we know it, from the University of San Diego. Um, so without further ado, Chief Norris, thank you for being here. Thank you, Dennis. It's my pleasure. Happy to be here. Uh, Chief Norris has a lot of um, a lot of accolades, a lot of things that um, he's known for. And one of the things that we're going to start off our conversation with is um, he's known as the data-driven police chief. And um, obviously, as we know, being able to support whatever you're looking for or asking for with data goes much further than just anecdotal um, stories. So Chief, can you just tell us a little bit about how you got that moniker? Yeah, sure. Uh, so early on in my uh, in my tenure here at Menlo Park PD, um, did an interview for one of the local papers and we started talking about, you know, my interest in staying um, you know, close to the data and close to good evidence-based practices as, as a way to, to really legitimize any, um, any changes or, or development that we do at this department. And, um, and they, they really kind of grabbed onto that. And so this, it became part of the, uh, uh, part of the lead in that article. And, you know, truthfully, I didn't mind very much. Um, I've always been kind of trained towards the scientific process of things. My, my early education, so my, my Bachelor of Science prior to coming to Menlo Park PD um, was kind of a, uh, it, was, it was a bachelor's degree in, in what they called health and human, human performance, but it was actually just kind of a, an array of different um, hard sciences as well as psychology. Um, so I come from a science background, a formal science background as part of my formal education. And what I've found, uh, because I never really knew that I wanted to go into policing, I kind of fell into it as a, as a occupation is that the, the process of investigating and the process of running an organization and the scientific process are very closely aligned. You still have to do you know all of those same things. And um, I actually wrote something a while back, kind of looking back into all of these different problem solving processes that um, that we have seen through the years, whether it's Goldstein's problem-oriented policing or, uh, you know, Bill Bratton's CompStat problem-solving process or the SARA model, uh, they all follow the same four-point plan, which is, you know, gather up good information, understand what you're working with through, uh, through good data, really assess what tools you have to, to address that issue, uh, both inside and outside your organization, really deploy a, a comprehensive organized plan to address it and then follow up and find out what works and what doesn't and what works you put on the shelf and you use it again and what doesn't work you kind of tweak it and you and you move forward and and try and make an adjustment and so um so for me you know that that really is the basis of, of you know how we move forward in policing and it doesn't matter whether you're talking about an organizational problem or you're talking about a a, a crime uh, trend problem, the process is still the same. And giving our personnel tools like here is your four point framework for solving any problem, and it doesn't matter what kind of problem it is, makes us a lot more flexible because 
as you know, Dennis, you know, policing is such a, a, a varied uh, type of profession where you don't really know what you're going to, what problem you're going to encounter today versus tomorrow. And every problem is different, but problem resolution can be a, a, a consistent process. And that really helps us to stay focused. Yeah. And especially when you can just a apply a pragmatic formula every time, it just, you know, makes things just much more seamless. And, right. you know, you're a graduate of the Lepsil program. And when the students are in that program, they're learning to do assignments that they're not just writing things that, you know, come off to the, you know, the top of their head. They're writing things that have to have an evidence-driven approach that, er that their argumentation is supported by evidence that's convincing and compelling and that they're citing sources and that what they're presenting forth is, is of publishable quality. Right. And I, I just think that's just an awesome attribute to a master's program that now you as a chief can apply that same strategy to, let's say we were just talking offline a little bit about staffing. Can you just talk a little bit about how you can use that evidence approach to getting something that everyone can recognize and that's more people? Yeah, absolutely. And, and in fact, you know, I think it, this is a, a really interesting place to start because um, if you if you look across the entire country, you, you will see all types of, of kind of varied approaches to uh, what's our population and how many cops should we have in this jurisdiction? And some of those things have to do with cost of living and budget. Um, you know, if you look at if you look at some places that that, that are, are maybe less wealthy than we are sitting here in the middle of Silicon Valley with, you know, the highest property values in the, in the nation, um, you might have a similar budget, but you're going to pay your police officers a lot less and so you can have more police officers with a similar budget in one part of the country versus another so um so when we look at how many police officers should we have we really have to regionalize that information and that that involves you know really digging down like we have a, a pretty comprehensive county where all the the local law enforcement agencies they vary a little bit in size but very similar in approach so I would rather look at those agencies in my county and say okay well we're looking at somewhere between 1.26 to 1.4 police officers per 1,000 population. And that's a better metric for us to look at our department size and our potential department increase based on population growth. Um, so that's that's one way that we would want to look at it. The other way is, you know, our, our officers are, are constantly wanting to make sure that they have enough staffing and patrol, right? This is a common problem that every Every police department wants to make sure they have enough staffing and patrol. So sometimes the question is, you know, are you uh, top heavy or or light on the top in leadership in your organization? What's your span of control look like? Um, but then there's also this really good evidence based information that um, comes out of uh, Jim McCabe, who's done a couple of studies. Um, the most recent one, I think, was out of Sacred Heart University, where he's talking about, you know, how you deploy your staffing across a police department. Really good evidence based information to say 60 percent of your officers should be deployed in patrol and 40 percent should be deployed in specialties. And so um, if I want to go back and talk to my city council about what my org chart looks like, I, I have something that I can lean on in the McCabe study to say this is how and why I want to deploy it you know, in this manner. So there's a couple of really good examples as to how you kind of dig deep and get that evidence-based information that will help you, you know, articulate what you want and when you want it. For sure. And, you know, like I said, I think that um, it's always easy for someone to just say, well, they want something that they don't have. And there's obviously a cost factor, but when you can support that ask with strong evidence, it just makes it again, I'll use those words, much more compelling and convincing to the person who controls that budget. Right. And um, and yeah, and, you know, we could talk data driven for a long time, but I just really feel that um, every person in an executive role within law enforcement, that has to be a foundational attribute because there's nothing anymore that you can just say, well, this is I just need this because there has to be right. supporting um, supporting information. Right. To, to get whatever that ask is. You know, one of the one of the things that I try to do it, uh, as I, you know, I listen to a lot of podcasts and a lot of them are, you know, cop stuff and police related because I just I enjoy that. Right. It's my career. I've enjoyed it for my entire life. But for balance, 
I listen to a lot of, uh, of, of information coming from the economics realm because I really think that, you know, economics, kind of the study of how people apply themselves to everything that's around them is just really interesting. And so, um, you know, one of the things that, uh, that, that I feel is the, that we need to talk about in terms of police hiring, and I know we talked a little bit about this kind of in our early intro this morning, was, um, was looking at the timeline. How long does it take to hire, to recruit, hire, and train a police officer, get them through the field training program, get them on the street and through their probationary period, which we know is, you know, still part of that learning process. Um, and and how, do, how do we get them from A to Z and how long does that take? And so if I'm looking at my city council and saying, hey, you know, I need three police officers um, added to our budget this year, which which I just, I just went through, um, I know that I'm not going to realize those three police officers real, realistically for, you know, up to 18 months because we have to we have to hire them. We have to get them through their their training processes. And until they are through their probationary period and really out there um, as part of our as part of our permanent workforce, um, we don't know that we have them. So um, I have to ask 18 months out. And so if I know that our population is going to expand, say, by 4,000 in 2026, which is the anticipated number with the large development that's coming in, um, I need to ask for those officers in the 2024 budget. And sure. so, you know, have, being able to prepare our council and talk to them about, you know, how that performance um, and, and the, the human factor figures in is really important. For sure. And, you know, we can almost do an entire podcast if we really want to just cover secession planning and, and, and how far out you have to start gathering that evidence and, and showing the need because most HR officers, they just don't connect as well with the need to hire 18 months in advance because of all those things such as mm -hmm. the basic police academy and probation and field training and just all those things to get a basic rookie fledgling officer out on solo assignment. Um, so, so yeah, I, I'm an ardent supporter of evidence-driven approaches, and it's it's um, it's, it's very clear that um, you're, you're the type of chief that will have a much higher chance of getting those tools and assets and staffing because of that. Yeah, we we have to be um, open and honest with you know with the people that hold our purse strings about what it really takes to make these things happen and. You know, policing has not always been the most transparent uh, profession, and I have found that as we've added in transparency, it's made it easier to have those conversations. What a perfect segue, because my next question was, you, when you were at San Mateo PD, you were uh, um, a key driver for your organizations, um, both your media relations and your community relations, and obviously we know from um, the 21st century policing report that building legitimacy and trust is is that main foundational pillar and and you were doing that um, at a very high level for for like a 10-year period of time if i remember correctly so can you just talk to the listeners and viewers a little bit about um what were some of your strategies to build out strong media relations which obviously equates to transparency as you were saying and those community relations sure and, and you know i was really fortunate because um, I, it, when I, when I got to the point that I had a couple of years on as, as a sergeant, as some of us do, you know, you get to that point where you've been promoted and now you're feeling like pretty comfortable with what you're doing. You're ready for that next challenge. Um, I really wanted to see what I could do in terms of just expanding how I saw the world as a police officer. And I'd like to say the first 16 years of my career, I did chase the bad guy stuff, right? Uh, worked in, worked in, you know, narcotics unit, worked in detective unit, uh, worked on the street as a patrol officer, field training, um, really doing a lot of, you know, what we call boots on the ground, uh, regular patrol work or, or chasing down, you know, people who are committing crimes. And I really wanted to know a little bit more about how the world viewed us um, how the, the police department interacted with the community, how the police department interacted with the media, and how those things informed how we made decisions. So I seized an opportunity. Um, I was the only one out of 15 sergeants who put in for uh, the community services sergeant position uh, at, our, at our department that, um, that I knew worked for a lieutenant who was the PIO. 
And at that time, the public information officer for uh, pretty much every police organization was only if something really, really bad happened, uh, and then only if a TV truck showed up, and then only if the TV truck wanted a statement did the PIO kind of spring into action, right? And everything was done kind of by fax machine, and it was, and and the the information that was going directly to the community was pretty minimal. Um, and uh, I was able to kind of get myself into that position, get apprenticed into the public information role, and then I had a I had a, a savvy lieutenant. Um, take me aside and say, hey, you know, all the chief really wants is for us to get up on like Twitter and Nixel. And so um, so we got us I got us signed up on uh, on Twitter and on Facebook. And I started to look at what other police agencies were doing. And this was 2010, 2011. So right at the very beginning of law enforcement, social media. And as it happened, there were there were a couple of people um, within our immediate area who were really grabbing onto this in the, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, myself, uh, the, the, uh, the public information officers from, from Redwood City, Palo Alto, uh, Mountain View, and Fremont uh, primarily, uh, we formed a small group called the Bay Area Law Enforcement Social Media Group. And what I found was I learned a lot by teaching. So we started to take what we were doing and reflect it out um, to some other local agencies in the Bay Area. And we ended up uh, holding a symposium and we had 50 Bay Area agencies show up to this symposium. And this was probably 2012 uh, when when it was just a glimmer in the eye of a lot of agencies. And so um, I had the opportunity to see this from the very beginning, which was which was really interesting. But, you know, what what really you know evolved for us with social media over the course of that next 10 years as i kind of stayed with it because i don't know if you did pio dennis but as you know like once you're once you're in it once you start doing that as a pio you never really stop and so i was involved with with that program really for the remainder of my career at san mateo pd and uh we went from doing what i called kind of simulcasting so we would we would create a, uh, a media release, right? We would push that out on Twitter, on Nixel, on Facebook, uh, with a link back to, to the media release, all kind of at the same time, so that we would get it across multiple social media platforms. And, and we were, very little of that was interactive. Most of that was pushing out to the public, just getting information out to them. Um, then we also had kind of a list serve locally. So what we took was from, about a couple hundred neighborhood watch block captains that would get information very occasionally from media relations uh, to you know tens of thousands of people getting um, immediate uh, information directly from the police department. And where that becomes important is obviously many years down the line. Now we see um, there anything that happens. Um, involving police that is kind of more negative gets a lot more press coverage. And so local agencies really have created their own news channels and are putting information directly out uh, to their communities so that so that we can control uh, the positive information that is happening in police departments and get that to our community in a way that's meaningful. And so it's gone from you know, a very one-way communication kind of simulcasted across many platforms to a very interactive. Many police agencies now have, you know, non, um, some of them non-sworn people that, that come from the media community that that are helping police agencies really tell their story well um, and uh, and doing a lot more interactive uh, communication with communities. And, and it is really up the level of community exposure of what we do. Yeah, I've, always been a, a big fan of that and, and you know whether you want to call it relational policing or or whether you want to just um, call it bridge building uh, community oriented policing as part of your philosophy the time to fix that proverbial leaking roof is not when it's raining so you don't want to start establishing those relationships when there's a crisis or when Absolutely. something bad has happened and just listening to you what you've done is you've already built that reservoir of trust with the media and with the community so at least if anything, if nothing else, maybe you'll get the benefit of the doubt when something happens that's questionable, or maybe something that's what they call lawful but awful, um, you know, just in its appearance or or what have you. And I, I just feel that 
having that as a, a foundational way, like, you know, you look at on the scientific level, you're doing everything with an evidence-driven approach, but then you're also using that humanistic approach with the media and, and with the community. And I agree, you can't just take off your PIO hat because all of those media contacts are going to always still call you because they know you, they trust you, you've established that relationship, so why lose it? I love okay. it. I think that's just something that every police officer um, should should really consider, and especially the further they go up the command chain. Yeah, and you know, and we started that strategy, and and I think many agencies started that strategy exactly the same way you just expressed it. It's like if we can drive up our followership, then if something really bad happens, we now have a way to communicate directly to the community. And what happened was, in addition to the the, the benefit that we get from having that subscribership relationship we also then had a really strong channel to communicate directly to our community when perception of policing really started to go on that downward slide in 2020 um, as there were all of these questions about social justice reform and everything in the the wake of the murder of george floyd um, not to say that that didn't start all the way back in 2014 or even prior to that right with the ferguson um incident and and you know many issues that happened prior to that um but really it became big and bad over this last couple of years and the agencies that have uh broad social media channels broad connection with their community whether it's in person or through media um, those are the agencies that are thriving and doing well and and whose communities are saying hey you know don't do anything to cut funding uh, of a police department. We we need our police. We trust our police. Um, that's, you know, what's happening nationwide and is getting kind of blown up by the media is not happening right here. Um, and it's really important. And here's another perfect transition point. Um, you know, my, my next question to you was going to be, you came over to um, Menlo Park PD from San Mateo and you came in a tumultuous time. 2020 brought the pandemic, civil unrest across the country. Mm -hmm a spike in violent crime, um, just things to which there was never a playbook. And that's what I always said. And obviously the, the funding movement, and you're trying to navigate all of that. And then as, as we're, we're hearing here, obviously you apply an evidence-driven approach, you apply a human approach, but can you just talk a little bit about what some of those obstacles were that you had to overcome for you and your agency um, as a chief coming in in the year 2020? Yeah, I, I I love that question because um, this was this was a, an agency with uh, really good people that was in the midst of a crisis that was not of their making um, that really needed they needed good leadership to step in and so um, in the immediate wake of the pandemic the city of Menlo Park like many jurisdictions anticipated revenue shortages and it made cuts across multiple departments in the organization. Uh, police department was one of those 15% budget cut, which equated to a 20% reduction in personnel, uh, which is pretty massive. Um, that's, you know, that's a fifth of your, of your, of your people. And, uh, and when you have an agency of less than 50, that's a, that's a big chunk. Um, so, uh, so we, we had that, we had that loss about a month before George Floyd's murder. And what was a, a, a real, you know, economically based decision to reduce budget um, became a discussion um, that bordered on a defund discussion that had more to do with questions about the police department. Um, reasonable questions that every police department was being asked, but, um, but you know, put, put every department in a difficult position. And in our agency, something happened that happened in a lot of agencies, which is the, the chief decided at that time that it was a good time for them to retire. And so that chief retired. And this department was in a real state of flux. Not only did they not have a leader at the top of the organization, but remember in, in May, June of 2020, uh, most police departments, the, the, the chiefs had gone in front of their department and said, look, we don't know what's happening with this pandemic. Um, we want you to kind of play center field. Don't don't be too proactive. Don't get yourselves sick. Don't get other people sick. 
uh, really be careful with, you know, go to the calls that you have to go to for safety, um, but don't push it too hard because, we, you know, we just don't know what's out there. And, and that was almost every department, right? But what happened is in most departments, when you got to the point of the, like the, the uh, late summer, early fall, um, when we started to kind of come back a little bit, most of the most departments had leadership that would step forward and say, look, go back to doing regular police work, go back to doing your job. Um, you know, let's we, we now know what we need to do to take care of ourselves. We've got, um, you know, the, they're working on vaccinations. We have the PPE out there. Go, you know, go do what you're what you're assigned to do. Um, but in a department that was in flux where we had interim leadership, there wasn't as strong of a message of go back and do regular police work because that interim chief and and he's you know he's a friend now um he just he didn't want to put the department in a position where a new chief would come in and do something different so he was very cautious about the the leadership and guidance that he gave this organization and you know now reflecting on that if i was in that position i probably would have operated the same way um but they didn't have good direction um, they didn't have firm direction because they didn't have a, a, a leader who was situated in the position to to give them that direction. Um, so there was a lot of questions, you know, and and that was then again, you know, late late summer, early fall of 2020, and that continued until April of 2021 when Menlo Park finally put in place their new chief of police. And so um, I had a couple of things that were working on uh, with me. I had you know, 20% reduction in staffing and some morale issues that naturally would come from that. I had uh, I had questions about, you know, should we go back to being proactive police again? Because all of these laws are changing, uh, the scrutiny is on us and we haven't had good direction. Um, so they needed, they needed direction and guidance. And they, and this was a department that had been through, I, I talked to police officers who had been with this agency for four or five years. And they said, you know, you're, you're my fifth police chief. So lots of revolving door on the office of the chief of police. And so, um, so we needed to do a couple of things. I and mean, the first thing that I made it clear to my department is um, I'm going to dismantle the revolving door on the position of police chief. You're going to get the same police chief. You know, I'm going to give you five years. You're going to get the same police chief. You're stuck with me for five years. Um, and then, you know, really wanting to know what, you know, given given that we are a little bit static here in terms of the size of the department and the budget, what can we do? And they said, we really need to just know more. We need more communication. We need to know about what's happening um, at the administrative level of this department, as well as at the city level. And so, you know, I instituted a Friday email every Friday. Uh, without fail. And now we're, you know, we're pushing, you know, 60, 65 weeks in a row. Um, I've been sending this department uh, an email on Friday to let them know what's happening. What's, you know, who should, who do we need to recognize that's doing good work within the department? What happened, what's happening in terms of decision-making around the, the leadership level of the department and the city organization. And then a little bit, you know, of the inside of the, of the chief's head um, in terms of, uh, you know, a little bit of philosophy, a little bit of uh, just sense of direction, uh, a little bit of what I'm thinking about that will help us move forward. Um, and I know that you you had uh, sent me a question asking about mentoring and coaching. And so that's definitely, you know, a piece where you have an organization that hasn't had firm leadership at the top for a long time. Um, they're looking for uh, getting that sense of direction to be kind of reinstituted. Um, within the department. So that's, that's the other big challenge. Yeah. And I'm going to get to that, that, that mentoring, that's, that's really what was going to be my, my follow-up. But one of the other things is, you know, one of the challenges with law enforcement, police chiefs and administrations is sometimes they operate in a vacuum and then you have your, your officers, they're kind of out of the loop and they're the ones that are responding to the calls for service. They're the ones mm -hmm. that are upholding your mission and, and working overnight shifts and dealing with all of the, the the tragedies of society. And and even if they may agree with what's going on, if they don't know something or why it's being done, it just leaves them feeling um, kind of left out. And the way you do it, I think just with a consistent message every Friday and just knowing that the officers have a voice, I think that is a, um, a strong attribute to your leadership. 
Yeah, and 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 we know that that's that's an evolving process, right? So, um, so I I was trying to give a lot of information to our department about decisions that we're making, but um, and I know you wanted to get into this a little bit, but I also had holes within the leadership of my organization. I had um, I had people who were sergeants working out of class in a commander position. Um, Mental Park is you know a smaller agency, so we're structured with a chief, two two sworn commanders. Um, I have a, a, a non-sworn manager that oversees dispatch and records, um, but two sworn commanders, one that oversees patrol, the other one that sees the, the oversees the, the support staff and specialty positions. Um, but one of those was not fully seated. So I had a sergeant working out of class as a commander in one of the in one of the commander positions. I had an experienced commander in the other. Um, so we we're operating a little bit lopsided. And there was a lot of uh, paddling under the under the surface that the chief had to do to, you know, kind of run run through some things that I couldn't ask a sergeant operating out of class to do in a command position. There are just certain things that that, you know, we shouldn't have to have somebody in that position do. Um, and so it was a challenge and it took me a year. Uh, almost a year to the to the date of the announcement of my position to be able to announce a new commander in the organization that I had to bring in from the outside. And that's my question. So you did bring in from the outside and you brought in, I gotta go right back to the Lepsil program. So you brought in a new commander who's a graduate of the same program you graduated from, program I graduated from and now in which I teach, and it's the law enforcement public safety leadership. And how much did his um, connection and graduation from that master's program play into you bringing him on as a commander within your agency? I, I will say just the name itself was an influential factor. Uh, but I, I am blessed with the fact that I'm somewhat surrounded by uh, Lepsil educated folks. So um, my next door neighbor in East Palo Alto, the, the interim chief there, Jeff Liu, um, also a Lepsil graduate. Um, and so uh, you know, bringing in uh, T.J. Moffat, who has uh, the the Lepsil credential as well as a, a lot of experience, um, was great. But what I have found is, and and we also just have a, a newly elected sheriff in San Mateo County, in Christina Corpus, who is also a Lepsil graduate. So you know, I'm really you know starting to be surrounded by people who have been through this program. What the program does for us is it gives us similar uh, breadth of perspective. So what we do in, in the discipline of the Lepsil program in really reaching out and looking uh, in a more 360 degree way around us to address and, and answer any questions that, that come our way um, is really valuable to myself as a police leader. Um, it really helps to know that I have a commander who is going to take kind of a holistic view of a problem in exactly the same way. Um, and and the other thing that the Lepsil program does for us is, um, and, and Dennis, I don't know if you if you were, you know, involved in academics throughout your police career or if you had a big break, like I'd, I had 30 years between my bachelor's degree and going to command college and then using that you know, kind of reinvigoration of the sense of academic discipline and rigor and taking that into a master's program. Um, but how do you think as as someone who's been through some formal education uh, through a master's program and how you approach problems is really different than the way I was approaching problems as a police leader who had not been, um, you know, through, through some academic rigors in, you know, a couple of decades plus. And so for me, that makes a big difference too, because the way we look at things, the way we research, the way we try and make sure that our decisions are really well-founded, um, that's a huge benefit because it's more sustainable in a police organization to come up with, with good solutions that have good foundation. For sure. And you know, I think the people who have a quality education, especially at that master's level, they can critically think and you can apply that critical skill to everything and and it doesn't just have to be in a uh, an academic assignment it could be how you're going to deploy your resources for an event or how you're going to deal with a conflict within the organization or how you're going to um get from a to b and all the way to z you know so i think that's really important i think also you learn to write well and express yourself in a very professional and polished manner and that lepsil program makes you do that and you you get, I watched my students get better and better at it. And for right. me, 
you may be the smartest person and, and may have great ideas, but if you can't present it correctly, then it may not get any traction. And and so like everything you just said, I think um, I, I just wanted to add those two things, the critical thinking aspect and the, and the writing and what an amazing network, because then you can narrow your... Um, or expand your reach for whatever the issue is, whether it's narrow or broad, and have someone else who's going to be able to be a, an assistant for you. Totally agree. And and the the network, the networks that I've built through the Lepsel program, as well as through the the post command college program here in California, um, have been invaluable. Um, you know, because you're also working side by side with people who are kind of you know trying to improve their position within the, the, you know, the policing world. And you have people who are moving up and continue to, to attain positions where they, they become peers at the ranks as you, as you move forward and, and attain more leadership responsibility. And we can lean on each other and we can, um, you know, I've always got something that I can dig up in a file that I can send to someone and vice versa uh, that will help with any particular problem. And it's not just from, you know, my, my LEPSL coursework, although that has helped too, and, I, and, I've, and I've used those things, um, but it's also in terms of like, you know, I know that what I have will be acceptable to someone who has been through a similar program and, and they can use it more adequately uh, than if I hadn't been through the LEPSL program. Right. And I, my next, my question was going to be about your, why you value teaching, teaching and mentoring so much, but it's evident. It's obvious that you just want to build people that'll kind of be of the same aptitude. And is it just so that you can always have someone ready to, to step in for you or to build them up to the next level? I mean, what is it that inspires you to do that? Yeah. One, one of the things that I noticed in this organization is that, um, because because the there there has been you know so many different changes in leadership. Um, when you have a change in leadership, you have a new chief, you have new direction, you have new philosophy, and what that's it's done is is it has a little bit degraded the ability um, of people with it who are leaders already within the organization to make good decisions on their own, feeling confident about those decisions, even though they're good decision makers and they should feel confident because they don't know what the next leader is going to think of that decision. And so there's a lot of like looking at the next level above to make sure that they're okay with their decisions. And so uh, developing that leadership at every level mindset within our organization is hugely important right now. It's like an enormous part of the recent uh, promotional processes that, uh, that we did here. So we just did, um, you know, we just did a commander process. We just did a, a corporal and sergeant testing and, making sure that I was finding and selecting and then cultivating people who are willing to develop leadership at every level. Um, that's how you have a sustainable organization, right? There's uh, what, what my old chief used to call confidence in the competence. And when you, when you have that at every level, um, then you have a more uh, higher likelihood of being able to do the right thing every time no matter who's watching, no matter what the circumstances are, um, and feel confident about it and know that the next level up is going to support it. So um, that's that's the biggest thing about mentorship and, and coaching is, you know, getting those people uh, who, who you know have leadership skill, no matter where they are in the organization, to understand what's expected of them, uh, what, are their, what their expectations are of the rank above, what their expectations are potentially of the rank below, and, and how to navigate that so that their decision-making process is sustainable. And, and, then, you, and then you have uh, something where you have confidence in everybody who goes out on shift, um, that they're going to do, they're going to make the right decision, they're going to do the right thing. Yeah, and, and for the individual themselves, I'm a firm believer that everyone who wants to advance or wants to better themselves um, in whatever needs a mentor. They need a coach. They need someone to help guide them along the path that that person has already traveled. And in law enforcement specifically, and I'll use myself as an example, the sergeant that I reported to day one when I became a police officer in 1995 is still a good friend and a mentor to this day. And that's, um, you know, 27, 28 years later, it's it's amazing that that's the type of relationships that you can build. And um and what I wanted to ask you is, 
in addition to coaching and mentorship, what are some what's some advice that you would give to someone who aspires to be a chief someday or just continue to advance from wherever they are, from officer to sergeant to lieutenant to what have you? What's the best advice you can offer? You know, the the the, the most important thing is to really be a sponge. You're constantly learning. Um, constantly ask questions, especially, you know, when you're when you're in a, a safe um, environment to ask lots of questions and learn, continue to learn. Um, that's that's one of the things I really have, have gained a lot of experience through learning by teaching. And so, you know, you learn material, you share it with others. Um, I, I've always said in 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 this uh, in this policing business that you know, anything, any training, any knowledge that you attain in this business is really not worth anything unless you're turning around and giving it away. So uh, part of it is part of it is picking it up. But the other part of it is sharing it with others. Um, those are two really you know, critical pieces. Um, I, I also really feel like um, it's OK to dislike a vacuum. Um, you're sitting around the briefing table. The sergeant asks a question and then there's silence. Um, be the one to step in, be the one to step in and say something, be the one to step in and ask a question. Um, if people are in, in your organization are asking for volunteers, be the one to step forward and say, I'll take that on. Uh, because even and, and not be afraid to, you know, to fail a little bit and to learn through, you know, failing forward, learn to learn through failure. Um, you don't learn unless you try. So making sure that you have the self initiative to try those new things. Be okay with the fact that if you have to learn from that and, and you know change your approach and move forward, that you can do that. That's awesome. And yeah, you know, if you look at fail, I heard it as an acronym once, first attempt in learning. And that's really it. And then to and you as a chief to be able to promote that sort of atmosphere, I think that's huge for anyone who, at least in your agency, wants to advance. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that that you have to have you have to have the courage to step to step into new things. I, I have my a question now that I'm going to start using to wrap up all my interviews. This is amazing. I feel like every question we covered, we could make it a separate interview. I mean, you're a wealth of knowledge, very well spoken, and um, everything you say makes sense. Leadership. What leadership book do you recommend for someone who um, just wants to improve their their skill set in that in that specific specific genre? So I'll tell you I'll tell you a short little story, and I promise it, it's really short. But um, but Commander Moffat and I uh, were were preparing for a, a recent team building workshop that we were doing. Um, I happened to uh, load up and listen to, and I realized I was listening to it for a second time. Um, a, a book, an audio book called Culture Code by Daniel Coyle. Um, and I, I get it on an audiobook. I like the you know twenty to forty minute bites at the at the apple and get a little bit of information. Um, but all all of the lessons in the second half of that book resonated with what we were doing to prepare for the team building workshop. So I so I sent a copy of it um, over, over to, to Commander Moffat because I knew that that he would see the same thing. I'm like, you got to listen to these chapters um, because this is what we're trying to do. And uh, and, you know, that totally resonated with him as well. So Culture Code by Daniel Coyle, I think it's a super easy uh, read, super easy as an audio book. Um, the other one that's super easy as an audio book, um, lots of cops are doing commutes now. So I, I just find audio books being a really easy way to do that. Um, Simon Sinek's Infinite Game, uh, really good, uh, concludes every chapter with some really interesting lessons and points. Um, that I that I think make a lot of sense. You know, policing, crime control, um, overall uh, health and welfare of of, uh, of of whatever jurisdiction you're policing um, is an infinite game. Uh, the finite game being like a football game, right, where you get to, to the fourth quarter and you just add up the score and then you're done. Um, policing is not a finite game; it's an infinite game. So uh, Simon Sinek's really good for that, and I know Simon Sinek has some other stuff that's going to be coming out. Um, over the course of the next year, it's going to be focused on public safety. So um, really good person to get to know how they set their philosophy. Um, I really enjoyed a couple of uh, longer police related books, one of them being The Profession by Bill Bratton. Um, highly recommend that you download it as an audio book so that you can listen to it in its original language, uh, Bill Bratton's Boston accent. 
and uh, and then also uh, Tangled Up in Blue uh, by Rosa Brooks. Um, also recommend that you that you maybe give your you know recommend that to your spouse um, because I think that it it does a really good job of breaking down that police academy experience and how it informs us as well as kind of the trials and tribulations that every cop goes through um, and and uh, just trying to struggle with um, especially in highly at risk in in need communities um, what you're what you're trying to accomplish as a police officer really good. Um, resource and then any podcast you can get your hands on, whether it's the the police related ones like the Cop Doc podcast or anything from Freakonomics Radio um, is really good. And don't forget all of the Blue Leadership podcasts that come out. Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. Uh, What a way to wrap this up. This is awesome. I I just, I think if if nothing else, not only does it show the, the, some great leadership books to read, but that you're a continual forever a student. And I think that's really it. You know, when you're in a profession that changes by the day and that has so many expectations and, and, and basically a zero acceptance rate for failure, you have to have that growth mindset to keep learning and um, to keep um, improving in your trade. So Chief Norris, thank you so much. I know Sarah's going to come in and close us out. Um, we're pretty much right on on the mark of 45 minutes, was what we were trying for. And uh, many thanks. Uh, lots of great information for the listeners and viewers. Thank you. I had a lot of fun. <laughs> yes. Thank you both so much for your time today. And to our viewers, we appreciate you taking the time out of your day to meet the law enforcement heroes and leaders who are a part of our um, MS Lepsil family. If you would like to watch previous episodes of Blue Leadership, you can find them on our video tab on our Facebook page or by searching USD Blue Leadership on YouTube. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. <laughs>